Coming up in this FinCast, part two of our build of the 180 Reef Aquarium. Today, we'll show you how to plumb the sump. Um, well, everything is just a little bit, you know, noticeably clearer, and it kind of gets rid of that. Sometimes you get that stale aquarium smell, and I think that the, using the Chemi Pier really uh, takes that all away and makes everything kind of like brand new again. Uh, the fact that it already comes in a bag, that's one less thing you got to buy. And, uh, of course, there's, you can float it, you can put it uh, so it's the water's passing through it, and uh, there's just a multitude of uses for the product. It's really great. Hi everybody, John here with another FinCast, and today I've got for you part two of the setup, the build, if you will, of my 180 Reef, and I'm so excited about it. As I'm sitting here right now today, it's been three weeks since we first put water in this aquarium, so I'll give you an update on how it's going, and then I'll back into it a little bit and show you uh, some of the features that, that I'm using to uh, build this, uh, the, the plumbing that goes down into the sump to make it uh, as easy as possible, and again, I'm dealing with an aquarium here that is a conventional tank that's sitting on a factory stand with a factory canopy. And there are some beautiful builds out there on the internet with guys dropping pipes through the floor and they've got a fish room and they've got all sort of uh, off-site, out-of-room uh, stuff. This is pretty much, I think, about as far as you can take it if you're going to use a factory stand. So let's take a look, first of all, at how the tank is doing right now today, and then uh, I'll show you how we got to where we are right now. So I gotta say, I feel like the aquarium is looking fantastic right now. I've moved everything from the old 120 to my newer and larger uh, upgraded 180 tank. It's been in the same room, but the 120 has now been emptied. It's in the garage. And I've moved all of my tangs over. Uh, I've moved over the corals that I had, uh, that were lingering in the old 120. And they are doing fantastic. I've also added some new corals that I picked up from mountaincorals.org, um, which is uh, corals that we are growing at Center of the Square in Roanoke, Virginia, to uh, help uh, raise money to keep the reef tank operation going there. It's free to the public, uh, but Carlin Aquarium Systems does maintain that, and so we, we try to help Center and offset costs where we can. So. Um, I do want to say that after three weeks, I'm starting to get a, a little bit of uh, a cycle. We're starting to see that brown algae, if you will, on the sand and on the live rock. Uh, that's actually not algae. It's what they call diatoms. At some point in the future, I may go into that a little bit more. That is something that should come and go all by itself, so I'm not overly concerned, even though it's not quite as pretty as you would like. But take a look at how well the corals are doing. I've got a bubble coral that I moved over from the 120. It was kind of shrinking back, and I'll admit that uh, as the summer months came, I paid less and less attention to the 120. That's something that I find that uh, uh, a lot of folks do in the summer, and I've been listening to some podcasts and watching lots of other stuff on YouTube, and a lot of guys are kind of admitting, yeah, when the summer months come or whenever something else happens, maybe a baby uh, arrives in the family or, or something new, and your enthusiasm for the hobby just dips for a little while, the tank suffers. And the, the 120 was there, plus I knew that I would be uh, uh, taking everything out of it and breaking it down, so I wasn't as enthused as I had been. Um, but at, at any rate, uh, most of the corals that were in there survived. In fact, all of my LPS were doing great, so you, you can look over now at the various pieces of frog spawn that I had. Uh, this bubble coral has come back. Look at the tentacles. Uh, the tentacle extension, and then some of the, uh, I brought an ACAN in uh, from our uh, setup over at mountaincorals.org, center in the square. It's doing fantastic. Uh, everything is just looking really, really happy right now. On the other hand, you kind of would expect it to. Uh, the tank is only three weeks old, so I haven't had a chance for my water parameters to go south. Uh, the tank has been relatively lightly stocked. Um, so the good news is, is that nothing has gone wrong. Uh, the better news is, is that everything is really happy. The realistic news is, is that after only three weeks, there hasn't been much of a chance for things to go south on me. But be that as it may, I am extremely happy with where the aquarium is right now. Now, 
Let's talk a little bit about how we plumbed this sum. Uh, my son, Ben, with Carlin Aquarium Systems, uh, is doing most of the hard labor and honestly most of the thinking on this. We're using some check valves and some gate valves, and I want to talk a little bit today before we're all done about the virtues of silicone tubing, which allows you to do some things that you can't do with hard plumbing. Once you hard plumb a tank, everything is kind of set in place. The silicone tubing is expensive, uh, but in my opinion, it gives you some flexibility and some options if you ever need to, to uh, move, for instance, your return pump a little bit. Uh, if you need to take something apart, you can do that more easily. And I'm pretty happy with silicone tubing. I would be very curious to hear uh, if anybody out there has had any experience with silicone tubing that hasn't been as good or who can make an argument uh, for hard plumbing to be a better solution in the long run than the silicone tubing. I've used it for probably uh, three or four years on the 120 and it, it has worked pretty well. So uh, I'm going to have Ben walk you through some of the things that we are doing now uh, to get to the place where we are today where I've got water going over the overflows and into the sump and being filtered. Starting with this right here, this is a Y check valve. Uh, three quarter inch, basically the water flow will come up, push a piston out of the way and allow water to flow up. Once water is cut, the piston will drop back down into place and prevent flow. I like this one in particular, it is a little bit more expensive, but it's very easy to clean. Basically this guy right here will unscrew and you can pull your piston out right there, that's what it looks like. Um, so really good for servicing. Uh, a lot of people are really unsure about check valves, I think it's a good backup safety precaution. I don't think you use it as something that you, you regularly rely on to work uh, if you're using it in some version of automated water changes, but we're just gonna have it as just a backup in case of a power outage. Okay. okay, so up next, I've got everything kind of all laid out. This helps me just sort of figure out exactly how much I'm gonna need of everything. Um, this is gonna be for our left-hand drain. We're using a gate valve here. Basically what these guys can do if you have them employed on one side of the aquarium or the other if you've got two drains in use is basically dial it in so that you can get a very specific amount of water flow coming through it. It, keeps, it helps to keep the aquarium a lot quieter if you ever get kind of that loud rush. It almost sounds like a flushing toilet. Um, it's good to have on there. Again, we'll just sort of dial it in. It's a set it and forget it type of method. Up next, this is uh, probably familiar to anybody who's ever plumbed an aquarium before. We have a unionized ball valve. This is the Dura brand, uh, which we do like. One of the things that I like about this is that it's unionized. Um, basically with aquariums, you really just can't have enough unions. What this is going to allow you to do is if at any point in time you need to service the valve, the pumps, anything associated, it just screws off easily um, and then you're able to kind of get in there and play without having to go through and start cutting pipes and everything because nobody ever wants to do that. Uh, so that's just the Dura ball valve. We'll have a few of them on this system. Okay, so you may notice that we've got um, one inch barb fittings on each of our pieces of PVC here. Um, this is something that I think may be more specific to our practices with aquarium installations, but I personally love silicone tubing. This is a one inch ID silicone tubing right here. Uh, it's very quiet, uh, vibrate resistant, but it's also just very flexible and easy to work with. It will kink really easily if you try to turn it too hard. Um, but for long runs, a lot of times I like it because it means that you can kind of wiggle your pumps around, you can move your reactors around, and you're not at risk of accidentally knocking a pipe too hard and causing, you know, something to break free, anything like that. So silicone tubing is very expensive. I think it usually runs about seven or eight dollars a foot, um, and we have eight feet of it here. So obviously it's a pretty significant investment, but we do have a lot of success with it and we use it on most of our systems. Uh, something new that we're gonna try on this system is this uh, OD Fusion single set uh, PVC cement. Normally I would actually use purple primer and then cement. Um, I've also used acetone before to clean all of my parts before gluing, which is really nice if you don't want that purple um, primer getting all over everything. So this is what we're gonna be using. Um, I'm excited to save the step, but we will report back later and let you know how it goes. Other tip about PVC cement is the lids are very hard to get off, so I love having just like one of these adjustable wrenches to sort of like help crack it open. So it's a little pro tip, <laughs> hope it helps. So after laying everything out, we attach the fittings with that PVC cement that Ben mentioned, and we let that stand for 15 or 20 minutes, not very long really. 
Then after we had placed all the hard plumbing, we cut the silicone tubing to length. We secured the ends with clamps. We turned on the Mag 7 return pump. I cranked up the skimmer and boom, our sump was working. Before this project is over, I want to remind you we'll be doing auto top off from the RODI system. Uh, I'll be adding a calcium reactor. I did already add a phosphan reactor in the sump, and I think that's a part of the reason that things are going so well. I'm running lots of ChemiPure in the system. Uh, also, if you watched part one, and if you, if you haven't, I suggest you go back and watch it to see how we got to where we are right now. I was running a canister filter uh, in order to get rid of the cloudy water and I've continued to run that canister filter I don't know why it just feels like it's a good idea It's not hurting anything. It's not in the way and uh, I, I did clean it out and it's helped me clarify the water That's where we are today a couple of notes now I want to talk about the uh, addition of fish and we'll get more into this next time uh, typically I would not recommend adding uh, tangs as your first fish in the tank because they can be, let's say, moderately aggressive. They're not going to be like your more aggressive trigger fish or, or some of the other more carnivorous fish, but tangs can be territorial. But uh, for instance, that sailfin tang that came over from my 120, I've had that fish now for 11 years. 11 years and almost all the other tangs and my Niger trigger I've had for five or six years plus I've actually lost count. So those fish I already had. If you were going to be populating your tank I would suggest that you start with the most docile fish first and then kind of make your way uh, up the the hierarchy if you will to the more aggressive fish. I would put tangs somewhere in the middle to middle maybe three quarter uh, hierarchy in terms of aggressiveness, but it is what it is. Uh, I wasn't going to get rid of these fish, uh, and so I just brought them over, and they're they're doing amazingly well. And when you've had a fish for 11 years, you start really thinking about, wow, what uh, what is the best thing for this fish? And and then again, the tail starts wagging the dog. Uh, and as I mentioned also in in part one, um, there are best practices with aquariums. Uh, there certainly is a lot to be argued for patients with aquariums. Um, some of us have patients, some of us don't. I've been in the hobby for as long as I can remember, either freshwater or marine, and I've even owned a, the local aquarium store for a while. So I know the benefits of patients. That doesn't mean I have it. Uh, and then I've got things going on, like I've got a lot of people coming through. We've got a wedding coming up. Uh, even as I speak, my wife is holding a, a, a wedding shower, um, and I kind of wanted that tank to look a certain way by the time all those people got here. That's probably not in the best interests of the aquarium. I might be rushing things a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's my aquarium, and I want to get the value out of it. And I also have the ability to do the water changes and to keep a close eye on it. And because it's brand new, I'm all about it right now. Uh, I think about this aquarium not 24 seven because I have other things in my life, but uh, certainly uh, I can tell you that uh, it's top of mind and I don't mind trying to stay in front of some of this stuff. And I know that, that I'm pushing a little bit in terms of uh, uh, getting those fish in there and getting the corals in there and so forth, but uh, I'm happy that things are going well. So I just, I just wanted to admit that, uh, that I might be pushing it a little bit. Hey, I um, appreciate you watching FinCasters. I would love it if you would go to my Facebook page. Uh, I just posted a link to a, what I think is an important article about what's going on in Hawaii right now where they have closed the fishery. So local people there uh, whose livelihood depends upon collecting fish for the hobby uh, have been told they can't do it. Uh, they cannot do it for commercial purposes. You can still collect fish for your own personal fish tank. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the hobby about how they think that, uh, that folks are overreacting. If the collection of fish is done sustainably and regulated, uh, there is a strong argument to be made that these fish can be taken off the reef safely. And this is where we get our yellow tangs, by the way. Uh, and that it will not harm the reef and it won't harm the fish populations. Now, it's got to be done right, but uh, I think that, uh, I think perhaps that people are overreacting. So what they've said is we're going to close the fishery. They want to study it. They want to figure out what the sustainable practices are and then 
Some people think it'll be reopened with maybe new restrictions, and some people think it won't be reopened at all. But at my Facebook page, I've just uh, I've just published, uh, not published, but uh, reposted what I think is an important article from Coral Magazine. So I think you might want to take a look at that. Okay, appreciate you for uh, appreciate you watching this fincast. And coming up, we'll show you the addition of more fish to the 180 reef. We will show you uh, probably the next big development will be the auto top off. And I really want to talk about the rock scape in there, which comes from real reef. And we'll be talking about that as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.